Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Meryl Lunen, and on behalf of the Cary Lecture Committee and Cary Memorial Library, welcome. The Cary Lecture Series is brought to you by the Isaac Harris Cary Fund, which was established by two sisters, Susanna Cary and Ellen Cary Farnham, in 1921. The sisters spent their summers in Lexington, and they wanted a way to give back to the town and help educate its citizens. And they also gave our town this beautiful venue, Cary Memorial Hall. The Cary Lecture Committee hosts four free public talks every year. Our next two talks of the season, so mark your calendars, will take place on Saturday, March 9th, when Lexington Public School's longtime beloved music director, Jeff Leonard, will join a panel of LHS alum who will talk about how music has shaped their life journeys. And on Saturday, April 20th, economist Raj Chetty will speak about his groundbreaking research on equality of opportunity in the US. You can find details and join our mailing list at our website, carrylectureseries.org. Just a couple of quick safety and other items of business. In the unlikely event of an emergency, if you could just look around and locate uh, where the nearest emergency exit doors, there's some up above, in the back, and in the front here. Also, we have assisted listening devices on the table in the foyer if you need one. You'll find restrooms downstairs on the bottom floor, and we ask that you please just take a moment to silence your cell phones. And now, I am thrilled to announce, uh, to introduce our guest for the evening. I first learned about Irene Lee and her food justice work through longtime Lexington resident Rachel Cortez, who was scheduled to be our moderator this evening, but unfortunately tested positive for COVID. Um, <laughs> Rachel has worked in the food industry for years, and she started doing May May dumpling runs for friends and neighbors during the pandemic, which was great. And later, when I asked her if she thought we should invite Irene to speak at the Cary series, she told me that, quote, Irene is the real deal. Irene Lee is a leader on the Boston food scene and beyond. She grew up in the Boston area, and she's a graduate of Cornell University. She started running a food truck with her siblings after college. In 2013, she opened May May Restaurant, and she spent the years since exploring ethical and sustainable food sourcing, encouraging financial literacy, and workplace equity in the restaurant industry. In 2022, Irene received the James Beard Foundation Leadership Award for her incredible work to address food insecurity in communities hit hardest by COVID and also to support independent mom and pop and immigrant run restaurants. She is committed to building a better, fairer food system. She serves on several nonprofit food justice related boards and she also founded Prep Shift to help fellow business owners thrive sustainably and equitably. Her two books, which she co-wrote with her siblings, include Double Awesome Chinese Food and her new release out just in time for your Thanksgiving leftovers, Perfectly Good Food, a totally achievable zero waste approach to home cooking. And we have both books available for purchase from Porter Square Books, and Irene has graciously agreed to sign copies after her talk in the lobby. So I will be stepping in to moderate this evening, a little unexpectedly. Um, Irene and I will chat for roughly 45 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor for audience Q&A. So I am so honored to welcome Irene Lee to the stage. Thank you so much, Meryl. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yes, OK. So we are so excited to have you, Irene. Let's start from the beginning. 
Family plays a big part in your story, from growing up in a Chinese-American family to starting a business with your siblings and writing a book with your sister. Can you talk with us about family and how it's played a part in your growth and your journey? My family has been in Boston for two generations now, and we are about as American as we are Chinese in many ways. Um, up here we have a photo of my mom, my sister, and my niece um, all making dumplings together in a rather um, food unsafe manner. You can see the child has her feet on the counter. It's not how we normally do it. but. We love talking about dumpling making because it kind of encompasses all the different parts of our family story. You might have seen as you walked in, we have some postcards about the dumpling classes we teach at our restaurant, and we model those classes after our favorite childhood memories, which is Lunar New Year or someone's birthday. Everybody gets invited over to the house. We put a big bowl of dumpling filling in the middle of the table, and then we make dumplings, we laugh, we tell jokes, we tease each other, we eat lots of dumplings, we take lots of dumplings home. <laughs> and for me, that is kind of exactly what family is about. About being with each other, about enjoying being together, about having fun and having a lot of good food to eat. So I grew up in this family that was all about food. I was much more interested <laughs> in eating than in cooking for many years, um, but eventually fell in love with cooking, and that allowed me the opportunity to move home um, when my dad fell ill. I took three years off between my junior and senior year of college, and that is what ultimately created the opportunity for us to create May May Street Kitchen. And I'll just add, the name of our business, May May, is very special because May May means little sister in Mandarin. So it was my big brother's idea to create a food business, and his two very opinionated Maymays got wind of it. <laughs> and of course, we, we just moved home and took over. Um, and so that is how the business started. And everything since then has really been about bringing people into our way of thinking about food and enjoying food with the people you love and also trying to bring our own practices and our industry's practices in line with the values that our family taught us and that we feel like our grandmothers and grandfathers can be really proud of. Can you hear me now? Yes. Speaking of that, so your grandparents, I think that's the next slide. Tell us a little bit about this. So my paternal grandparents immigrated to New York City and originally opened their first restaurant in Harlem and then their second restaurant in Westchester County. And my grandmother, um, in addition to being highly educated and running um, a wartime orphanage for children um, and young women back in China, became the sort of consummate hostess uh, and poster woman for this business. So here we have um, a cutout. It is a bit blurry, um, but you can see she is very glamorously dipping something into a, a hot pot. And she introduced, I think, many of Westchester County's um, American uh, residents to the kind of art of Chinese banquet dining. And of course, like so many immigrants to this country, creating a food business was maybe not plan A, but it was what was available to them. And so my grandparents made it work. They put five children through um, college, through terminal degrees, you know, they're, they're doctors, lawyers, and physicists. And um, here we are, back in food. Um, my mom likes to say, there's always time for medical school, but we think otherwise. Um, but all of that is to say, I think we recognize that we're of the generation where we get to choose what we wish to do. And so um, going back into food, <laughs> Um, instead of being a step backwards, we see as coming full circle and also an opportunity and a responsibility to try to make the world a better place through food. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> so I'm trying to imagine working with your siblings, and here you are. Any fun stories to share, maybe from those food truck, early food truck days or early restaurant? I think one of my favorite stories goes back to the early food truck days, and this was 2012, so food trucks were relatively new to the city of Boston, and um, one day 
we looked out the window of the food truck and Yotam Ottolenghi, maybe you've heard of him, um, was standing right outside the window. Um, and my brother had actually, so the amazing thing about my brother, he is a consummate hospitalitarian. Um, he is not really a cook. <laughs> Um, and he doesn't follow celebrity chefs, he doesn't buy cookbooks, that's really not his bag at all. And so he actually had been chatting with Yotam for a couple of minutes. Yotam was in town, and for those of you who don't know, Yotam Ottolenghi is a, a very accomplished um, British Middle Eastern chef who I think probably introduced many of us to Middle Eastern ingredients that we'd never had before, so just kind of a, a god of food. He was in town um, because their surrogate, he and his partner's surrogate, were delivering their baby in a Boston hospital. And he had been wandering down the street. And he stumbled across our truck and thought the menu sounded so unusual. You know, it wasn't a hot dog cart. <laughs> and um, we, I think, my sister and I just were totally agog, um, trying to believe our eyes. And our brother was just like making small talk with this guy like he was anyone else, which I think kind of captures both like our strengths and the sort of magic of having our brother blithely speaking to this celebrity chef while we were just losing our minds um, on the other side of this very small truck. But I think that what I loved about being on the food truck is that the guest is right there and the kitchen is right there. And so there's so much interaction that's possible that you don't necessarily get in a regular restaurant. And so many chefs, they don't actually get to see all the customers who they serve um, or to notice if that customer might be Yotam Ottolenghi. <laughs> so I always think back to that moment. Um, Ottolenghi also you know, tweeted that he loved the food and, and all these things. So that for us, I think, was a moment of like, wow, we're doing this. <laughs> that's, that's so great. So I know your career journey has been full of intention and adventure. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey and any major influences? Maybe Otto Lange is one of them. Yeah, I, the word intention is so funny because um, I never had a plan. I don't think any of us had a plan, but we allowed the kind of strategy to emerge in front of us. Um, we opened the restaurant a year and a half after the food truck opened, and so many people said to us, wow, you're, you must be so successful opening a restaurant right after you open the food truck. And we would say, uh-huh, yeah, but the reality is <laughs> we needed our own restaurant in order to make the food truck sustainable um, because you need to pay for kitchen space so that you have somewhere to put your trash and get your water. And we were working out of this shared commissary, which is still a model that many food businesses use, but it's kind of like, you know, if you left your house for work in the morning and then someone else came in and slept in your bed and used your toothbrush, that's what working in a commissary kitchen is like. So we opened the restaurant because we had to. Um, and I think from there, we were really able to dig deep into what do we want this to be? What do we want this place to feel like? And this is a picture of um, part of the interior of the restaurant. Um, it was located uh, outside of the Kenmore neighborhood near Fenway Park um, in a little kind of intersection called Audubon Circle heading towards St. Mary's Street in Brookline. And we had always been really committed to the way we sourced our ingredients, um, buying meat from animals who were raised on pasture, um, who had a great long life and one bad day, as we like to say. Um, and as we kind of moved into the restaurant space, we started thinking about, okay, the animals live great lives. How do we make sure that our employees also have great lives? And can welfare be something we think about more broadly than just as it applies to the animals that we eat? And so over time, we started thinking about how to make these jobs work for these people who we cared so much about. And I had a sous chef in particular named Emily. And Emily was a Korean American um, who had studied neuroscience at MIT and one day just walked out of the lab and said, I've had enough and I need to work with my hands doing something other than killing mice. Um, and so she had come and um, learned how to cook uh, with our team. 
And she was living in a house in Cambridgeport with a bunch of other, you know, PhD students. And I just looked at her and I thought, you know, if I was Emily's mom or Emily's partner, or Emily's best friend, I would say, I don't know, Emily, that kind of seems like a dead end job. And that was a very painful thing to think about. Um, we had so many employees who were incredibly passionate, who were very loyal, who were with us through you know, the highs and the lows. And I felt that we were kind of ultimately doing them a disservice. You know, Even though the restaurant's busy and it, it's beautiful and the food comes out looking really good, these people don't have health insurance. How are they going to buy a home? How are they going to have a family? Um, and so we started really thinking and kind of soul searching about how do we make this job a job that people can live with, <laughs> um, that people can stay in? And that is part of what led us to shifting the business in a number of different ways about five years into the life of the restaurant. And one of the things that happened was that my brother and sister had kids. And so they both were very, very busy with their children. And it turns out that being an amazing and hyper-present parent does not really meld with being an amazing and hyper-present restaurant owner. <laughs> we all should have seen that coming, probably. But we made a transition um, so that I took over the business. And that was in 2018. As soon as I took over the business, I started thinking about who's going to help me run things. And I was thinking still about how to make these jobs work. And we ended up implementing a system that folks may have heard of called open book management, which essentially educates the staff about how the business works and then teaches the staff how to read the numbers and then empowers them to actually influence the numbers. And so it turned out, all the staff was going to help me run the restaurant. So over time, we did a lot of financial literacy program. We taught everyone on the team how to read a profit and loss statement. We made sure they knew that the average profit margin for an independent restaurant in the US is between 3 and 5%. And so we tried to give them opportunities to understand their context fully and then to actually make differences in the business. So we did, for example, a challenge about cost of goods, which is the ingredients and the packaging. And we said, in the next three months, any improvements you can make to the cost of goods that are aligned with our values and any money you save us over what we normally spend, that's going to go in a pool and you guys get to keep it. And so we had them uh, call our vendors and negotiate. We had them reprice our menu. They reformulated recipes. They implemented systems for tracking waste. And they saved the business about $12,000 over three months. And then we paid all of that money out to them. Um, and that was just incredible. And just one example of the way that we thought, OK, this is how we're going to move this forward, not at my expense or their expense, but with our shared kind of vision and benefit. Um, and that is what led me to also bring on two new business partners, um, Annie and Alyssa, who are Babson MBAs. They're so, so smart, <laughs> so capable. And they are the ones who actually run Maymay day to day um, in the present moment. So I'm curious to know a little more about the open book management. I mean, what does it look like in practice? Do you all get together and pour over the profit and loss statements? And do you get buy-in from all your employees? How are they? How do they react? Obviously, they did save the restaurant money. And yeah, so open book management for us was a huge investment of time and resources. And look, not everybody who works in a restaurant wants to learn about numbers. Some of them are just, you know, cook the food, serve the food, get your paycheck, and go home. And we understood that that was the case. But so many people also came to work at Mame because they were curious about what the inside of a small business looks like. They wanted to maybe have their own food truck one day or their own restaurant. And we weren't teaching them anything that they couldn't have learned on YouTube, essentially, <laughs> um, by just showing them how to cook or how to serve. And so there were um, hours and hours of curriculum that we delivered to them. Um, you know, what's the difference between um, toilet paper and paper napkins on the profit and loss statement? 
Um, what are the uses of profit in a business? Um, you know, all the profit doesn't go to my yacht and monocle fund. <laughs> there are things that we have to do with profit even before we can pay it out to the staff. Um, and so that was a very long kind of journey to get the staff to the point where they could look at a P&L, not maybe the full three pages of profit and loss statement, but maybe five or 10 relevant lines and be able to say, oh wow, you know, labor's running high this month and we think we know why. We think it's because we had some turnover, we've been training people, um, and so we had to double schedule the shifts, and so next month, labor should go back down, but because we overspent, we should really be thinking about taking on more catering, so that revenue can offset what we've been up to. And one thing I will say is that catering for so many food businesses is the difference between breaking even and being profitable enough to continue for another year. But most people, even talented cooks, and especially talented cooks, do not get into the restaurant business so that they can be caterers. So it's very motivating to be able to show the team, hey, when we cater, we're profitable. And when we don't cater, we're not. So what do you think we should do when people ask us about catering? So there was a lot of kind of trying to present the information and allow them to analyze it to the extent they were able to, and then having regular meetings to actually look at the numbers. Um, so much of open book management, which is a lot more common in manufacturing industries and sort of, it's our, I guess, to an extent in kind of the startup industry, so much of it is just about setting a goal, working towards the goal, and measuring your progress. And any you know, management consultant will tell you that that <laughs> has a huge impact, especially in an industry where so often we're just putting out the thing that's on fire today. And so those regular meetings um, combined with different initiatives that we would take on and different incentives that we would set up, that's really what open book management looks like in action. And one thing I will say, also is that we, um, a lot of times we talk about overhead expenses, that's stuff like your rent, your utilities, uh, your phone bill, as being um, expenses that you can't really control. But our team at Maymay ran out of expenses to control, and so we turned to our overheads, and we did this big challenge about overhead expenses, and what one of our managers realized was, if you take the most talkative staff member and you put them on the phone with Comcast and you say, don't let the Comcast rep go until you get a discount, amazing things happen. <laughs> so, you know, I think part of, part of managing people in a way that is respectful and that sees them for who they really are and for their full selves is to recognize that sometimes your weakness is your strength or vice versa. So if you're the most annoying employee, you get to call Comcast. Um, and of course we teach you know, that cash drops to the bottom line. Um, we get a discount from Comcast and that doesn't show up somewhere else as a different expense, um, except for maybe that employee's time, which was still worth it. <laughs> and so that I think, again, to be able to show our employees, hey, you can have an impact here. Um, you can see the results of your work and then you can actually take home a little extra cash because of it. Um, that was just, it changed my life. Um, and I think it changed things for the employees. It also, it, it made the business so much more fun to run. And in my consulting practice now, which is also part of how I spend my time, I think so many small business owners who we work with, they feel alone and they feel like they're the bad guy. Um, because they're saying, hey, like, don't use so many towels, or like, oh my gosh, you dropped that expensive maple syrup. And what we want people to know is that your boss is not your enemy and your employee is not your enemy. Um, the numbers are what you have to contend with. And I think there was just so much weight lifted off my shoulders when I felt like we had that understanding. I love how passionate you are about financial literacy. <laughs> I think that's great. So I wanna jump to the pandemic, which was clearly a really difficult time to be running a restaurant. That's probably an understatement. I know you had ups and downs, but you did such incredible healing work to support some of the people and businesses hit hardest. Can you tell us about some of your projects during the pandemic? Yes, so the big one that we started with was a GoFundMe campaign called Unsung Restaurants. 
And one of the things that we were seeing online was lots of kind of high profile restaurant owners and groups were, were going to the internet and saying, hey, you know, would you contribute to help us take care of our staff? Um, would you buy gift cards? Would you donate? Um, and I thought that was really great. And I also just worried that no one is going to help the Vietnamese restaurant on the corner, who I rely on. <laughs> No one's going to help them fundraise because they don't have Instagram. They don't have a PR consultant. Um, they don't send a newsletter. And so we invited our community to just send money and say whatever restaurant they wanted to give it to. And we said, we will find a way to get that money to that restaurant. And so we raised a very small amount of money, $15,000. Um, but we mailed out all of those checks. And we, um, w they all got deposited. So I know they went somewhere. And I think, in part, it was just a way for us to stay connected to each other. Because in COVID, if you can't get a newsletter from the restaurant and the, you know, the, the lights are off. Um, how do you know what's going to happen to those folks? And we saw so many restaurants close, and we're going to keep seeing restaurants close as you know as debt service comes due. And I just hope so deeply that the kind of unsung heroes of our industry are able to survive. In addition to that, um, we also transformed the restaurant into an emergency feeding operation. We did that in partnership with an organization called Off Their Plate, which um, paid us to prepare meals for hospital workers. Um, and that was incredible because you know my, my parents worked in the medical community in Boston forever. Um, and so to be able to feed medical workers was very important to us. And at the same time, we were hearing from medical workers like, this is so great, but we we can afford food <laughs> for the most part. And they were saying, we're seeing patients who do not have health insurance, who are dealing with food insecurity, and is there, is there anything you can do for them? And so we partnered with a couple of different community organizations, many of whom served undocumented families, frontline working families. And we embarked on this adventure to raise enough money to buy about 10,000 pounds of food, culturally appropriate food for mostly Latin American families. And then we invited our community to help us drive that food all over Everett, Chelsea, and East Boston. And in one week, we raised all that money, we moved all that food, and the community organizations called us and they said, when can we do it again? And we were like, oh, snap. <laughs> we need to uh, build some more shelves in the dining room. Um, and so for several months, we did that work. Um, and the organization that we created is called Project Restore Us. And Project Restore Us still does some community feeding today in different forms. But what it really was about, I think, is how do we leverage the industrial supply chain to feed people in times of emergency? because I drove to work every day and I saw the lines outside of Trader Joe's, but then I could sit in my empty restaurant and receive 10,000 pounds of food without standing in line at all. And so we really wanted to see, is there a way to take the abundance that we have available to us at a great price and leverage that for the people who need it the most. And so we were delivering 50 pound bags of rice and beans. Um, we caused a little bit of a masa shortage in the Northeast, I think. Um, and we heard from families who received um, not just staples, but also fresh produce. One of them, um, one of our recipients called and he said through a, a translator, basically he said, I, I am a delivery driver and now I'm out of work. And some gringo just dropped a bunch of food off on my doorstep, and I have never had anyone deliver food to me. Usually, that's my job. And so, again, I think creating these moments of connectivity, even if there is no face-to-face, -face, you know, <laughs> six feet of no contact, um, was something that I think kept me going through this difficult time. And, and we really believe and hope um, that it reached other folks and gave them a way to continue to pay that forward. That's terrific. And Obviously, you weren't expecting it, but what was it like to then find out that you won the James Beard Leadership Award? Yeah, that was kind of wild. Um, so uh, the James Beard Award um, 
It came at a moment when I had sort of pressed pause on May May and we were trying to decide what to do with the business. Um, we had been running it for about nine years and I have to say that COVID really took it out of me. And the way I felt, you know, we had just a couple months, or sorry, just a couple years left on our lease, and I sort of felt like, oh my God, like I, I just built this business. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> um, and so there was sort of this soul searching, and, and this was when Annie and Alyssa came on the scene in many ways. Um, and also I think this I took as a signal that there was opportunity for me beyond May May. We opened May May when I was 21, and I don't know exactly what I thought was going to happen, but there was definitely part of me that was like, oh, well, I'm just going to do this forever. <laughs> um, like, you know, my mom worked at MIT her whole career. My dad was at the Farber for decades, and I'm just going to run this business the same way for 30 years. Um, and of course, that's not what happened. But I kind of needed a little bit of a jolt to think outside of, of that pathway that I had seen forward for myself. Um, and of course, the James Beard Award was very bittersweet because we hadn't been able to serve customers and we'd had to lay off staff. And so it also prompted a lot of reflection and I think gave me, yeah, an opportunity to think about enough of what I've done <laughs> How do I want to move forward? And that's what ended up kind of pushing me towards prep shift and taking this broader view of the industry while May May kind of went off in its own direction. Okay, so we're gonna to get to prep shift yeah. in a little bit. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you source ingredients at May May and the building relationships with local farmers and local vendors and what, what's that like and why it's important? Definitely. Um, I fell in love with um, cooking and, and eating things that I had cooked when I was a student um, at Cornell. And Ithaca, if you've been there, you may know, has a really incredible farmer's market. And um, I, I didn't grow up in a religious family, but I went to the farmer's market every weekend and I kind of thought to myself like, oh, maybe this is what church feels like for people who go to church. <laughs> like you're just, you know, you're with your community, you are, um, you are taking in the kind of um, beauty and, and bounty of what the earth has to give you. Um, and so I started going to the farmer's market religiously <laughs> and talking to the farmers, getting to know them. Um, you know, a great way to start a conversation with a farmer is like, what went wrong this week? <laughs> and usually they have a lot to say. And so learning more about agriculture, appreciating where food really comes from, um, that made food taste alive and vibrant in a way that I had never experienced before. And so I started volunteering on farms and helping with harvest. Um, I went to uh, a Mennonite slaughterhouse uh, that's west of Watkins Glen where they do the NASCAR races. And I, you know, I, I bought these beautiful steaks uh, from this Pennsylvania Dutch speaking family. And eventually I worked up the courage, I don't have a picture of it, don't worry, um, but to buy a whole pig from the slaughterhouse. And I figured, okay, if I want to eat really nice meat, I'm probably going to have to learn how to break it down myself. And so taught myself about butchering and just gained such an appreciation for, for where food comes from. And so knowing that food can be so magical and so connecting really made going to the grocery store kind of a bummer. <laughs> because, you know, those blueberries you eat, you, you will never know where they really came from or who picked them even if you wanted to, and many of us just don't. And so I felt like going into this food truck enterprise, there was an opportunity to bring that spirit to the truck, to the street, and to provide kind of farm to table at a price point that was a lot more manageable for someone who works in an office to have for lunch. Um, and I think, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, if you wanted to eat grass-fed beef, you kind of had to go do it at a white tablecloth restaurant. Um, so we wanted to change that. And building relationships with farmers, seeing them not just as um, transactional partners, but knowing that they were family businesses, they were businesses that were growing as well, that really meant a lot to us. And so one of the things that we did during COVID was 
we pivoted Maymay to be a dumpling company. And, you know, dumplings had always been kind of at the core of our culinary concept. Um, but we had a guest who came to the front door of the restaurant um, and, you know, wearing his mask and we were wearing our masks and he just sort of said, hey, would you guys ever consider coming to the farmer's market and selling your dumplings? And I have to tell you, I looked at my business partners, Annie and Alyssa, and I said, I don't want to go to the farmer's market. <laughs> Because in my mind, I thought to myself, you know, we're a restaurant. We don't go to farmer's markets. And farmer's markets are for startups and small companies. And we're a big company. And they basically looked at me and said, this is a startup again, Irene. Like, sorry <laughs> if you thought you'd arrived somewhere. But this is COVID, and so we're all startups again. And so much to my disdain, we went to the market. And um, I think the first one was the Belmont Farmer's Market. And we actually had to send our van back to the restaurant twice to restock because people were so excited. And during COVID, you know, we threw everything at the wall to see what would stick. And so to have anything sell out was like, a, you know, a, a, a ray of sunshine coming down from the clouds. So, we pivoted our business to dumpling production. We bought a machine from Taiwan that um, allows us to produce between 30 and 40,000 dumplings every week. And you can see it actually in the background of this picture. And right now we sell those dumplings at about 40 farmers markets in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And we're just breaking into wholesale so that stores can carry our dumplings as well. But the incredible thing that's sort of full circle is that selling dumplings at the farmer's market is kind of back to my roots, back to how I got into this in the first place. And you can see this great picture of our team member, Caitlin, at the market. And when we would go to the markets, the farmers would walk up and say, like, hey, you know, do you need any grass-fed lamb? Do you need any scallions? Do you want to take a look at this box of seconds tomatoes? And so those connections even though everything felt so disconnected during COVID, those connections were formed naturally again. And that was such a cool feeling. That's great. And I'll just put in a plug that May May dumplings are also available at the Lexington Farmer's Market. <laughs> and will be at the, um, the Thanksgiving Farmer's Market this right. week. Coming, yes. <laughs> and I told them to bring extra, so sells out. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I know you've been outspoken about issues of misogyny, abuse, bigotry in the restaurant industry. Can you share some of your thoughts on this and any progress that's been made towards a better future? I think that we are making a ton of progress in the restaurant industry, and I am really, really happy about that. Um, I personally am fortunate to have never worked under an abusive boss, um, and that is not the case for many people. I know of so many women who would have loved to have their careers in food, and ultimately, for any number of reasons, couldn't make it work. They couldn't deal with how they were being treated, or the long hours, or just the kind of like inhumane pace of the work. Um, and I feel sad when I think about that, because they would have opened such great restaurants um, that we would be able to eat at today. And so when we look forward, I think there are a lot of things that still need to change about the restaurant industry. It would be nice to have more accountability around bad actors and, um, you know, Obviously, we're all human and no one is perfect, but there are a lot of folks who have been hurt by people who still work in this industry and still run busy restaurants. On top of that, I think we need higher standards around how we think about food and what we're willing to pay for food. Um, there is going to be an initiative on the ballot next year for Massachusetts to raise the minimum wage. Um, so that there is not a tipped minimum wage that is below $15 an hour. Um, has anyone here ever served in a restaurant? Okay, a couple folks maybe. So you may know that the federal minimum wage for a tipped worker is $2.13. The state minimum wage is a whopping, I think, $6.75. And the challenges with tipping are, are many. One is that tipping really polarizes the industry because a fine dining server can make six figures, 
but if you are a single mom who works the overnight shift at IHOP, you are almost certainly experiencing wage theft. And these crimes happen along racial and gender and immigration status lines. And in order for us to fix that, we need legislation, and we also need our guests to be willing to pay more for food. Um, I think that we do not attach the appropriate value to food in our culture. And I have, to, I have to say, I think that probably goes all the way back to slavery, because the true cost of commodities in this country has always been out of whack. And actually, tipping, as you may know, is a practice that came out of post-slavery reconstruction uh, South, because black workers were going into hotels and becoming porters on railroads, and their bosses didn't want to pay them a full wage. And so the subservience to the guest, the reliance on the guest for that full hourly wage is something that uh, you know black workers were forced to tolerate. And that persists to this day. And the National Restaurant Association and many other trade organizations will say, um, that it hurts small businesses to raise wages, and that there are many servers who are happy to make the wage they make. And to that, you know, it's just the right thing. And we can't do the wrong thing just to stay in business. And so Maymay has shifted in a way that has, I think, made us more resilient in the face of these kinds of changes. And may I also add that in the midst of a very difficult time in the labor market, Maymay has no labor shortage. Amazing. We are overstaffed. And um, I think that creative business models, unusual business models, business models that prioritize the welfare of workers, and you know, Maymay is only open to the public four days a week. And three days a week, the public really does not like that. But it's what makes it work for us, and that is why we can offer such a great experience, because our team is so happy. And that's what allows them to take care of the guest. So I guess all of that is to say, I think the restaurant industry needs to take a hard look at itself. I think we need legislation to help us move forward, and we do need our guests on board as well. And I think that's a great transition to prep shift and the work that you're doing to counsel other businesses. Yeah, so let me just see. I forget which slides we have here. Oh, here's the new May May. Come take a dumpling class. They're the most fun. You want to give us the address? Yes, <laughs> we are at 58 Old Colony Ave in South Boston. And I'll just say briefly that um, May May is now what we call a dumpling factory, cafe, and classroom. So when you walk in the front doors, there's a menu that you can order from. There are probably going to be classes taking place in that space, maybe at the same time or maybe on a different day. And then there's a huge window that looks onto our production floor. And that's not just so that you can see our team, but also so our team can see you and they can see daylight, which we think is very important. Um, and May May is being run primarily by my business partners. And so I am so lucky that I have gone from working in the business with my hands on the dumplings <laughs> to on the business and now to working alongside the business. And I like to say, um, I, I'm trying to be the cool aunt at May May. <laughs> May May is not my baby anymore, um, but I, it, it can be my, my niece or my nephew. So what am I doing with my time? Um, I founded Prep Shift along with um, two other partners, one of whom worked with me at May May and one of whom uh, has a background in finance. Um, he's our, our local finance bro. Um, and Prep Shift is all about helping business owners practice their values through the way that they run their businesses. And we want to make sure that the restaurant industry works for everyone. So again, not just guests, not just owners, but also workers and everybody else who's part of the ecosystem. So we leverage city funds, state funds, and private funds to provide technical assistance, coaching, and consulting to independent businesses of all sizes. So we have clients who are bakeries and coffee shops and um, ice cream scoop shops and full service restaurants. And I just feel so lucky <laughs> that this is my job. I can't believe that I get paid to do this because 
We get to identify the businesses that we really want to support. We get to go in there and help them. And then the state <laughs> pays us for it. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's kind of a miracle. But it's also a way for me to leverage what I've learned from May May and the mistakes that I've made that I don't want anyone else to have to make um, and to try to pay that forward. And one of the things I always say is like, listen, at the end of the day, on some level, I'm in this for myself because I just want there to be lots of cool restaurants. Like, I can't be 90 years old eating Taco Bell, and like, that's where we're headed if we don't fix this thing. Um, and so there's a degree of just security in it for me so that I can eat cool stuff uh, when I'm old. And, um, oh, dumpling class? I think we all appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, and I'll just go ahead to this photo, which is um, me and my very lovely friend, Michelle Wu, um, in the background. And this is a picture, and I'm, I'm signing a supplier diversity uh, compact for the city of Boston. And so some of what Prep Shift now does is about helping small businesses access government and other large institutional contracts. Because like I said, catering <laughs> is what really brings it home for a lot of small businesses. And so we're working not just with individual businesses, but we're trying to be part of an ecosystem that really puts small business first. Um, and to make sure that of all the public funding that is available out there, that some of it's going to restaurants and some of it is going to the restaurants who need it the most. And we're able then to offer consulting to the kinds of businesses who either couldn't afford it or don't even really know what that word means. But because we have personal relationships with them, we have the lived experience, we can just walk in and say, say we want to help. OK, I know we're getting to almost audience Q&A, but I just want to, I don't know where you find the time, but you also participate in and support so many nonprofits and other businesses with missions that are so critical. and the areas of sustainability, alleviating food insecurity, workers' rights. Can you just tell us a little bit about some of those nonprofits and what drives you to do that work? And maybe people want to know about some of those nonprofits and what they're doing. Certainly. So I serve on the boards of a couple of nonprofits, all in the food space or kind of partially in the food space. The first is the Haley House, um, which is a soup kitchen and um, housing and uh, bakery cafe organization that's based in Roxbury. Um, Haley House has been around for over 50 years and one of the most important programs that they do is they run a soup kitchen breakfast um, and lunch out of 23 Dartmouth Street in the South End. In addition to that, they have um, a bakery cafe that's gonna be reopening next year, and that's kind of where my expertise is. Um, and they also provide transitional housing, employment training, and some other incredible services um, to Roxbury community members. I also work with Project Bread, which is a statewide organization that advocates for anti-hunger policies. And Project Bread famously runs the Walk for Hunger, which you may be familiar with. And Project Bread also led a campaign to pass universal school meals um, for all children in Massachusetts. So every child who goes to a public school can have free breakfast and free lunch. We are, I think, the eighth state in the country to pass this kind of legislation. And this is going to completely change the future for our kids here in Massachusetts. So I'm, I'm very, very proud of that organization. And then I also work with the Food Project. I was just on the farm at the Food Project actually earlier today. And um, the Food Project brings together young folks, high school age, um, from very diverse backgrounds, suburbs all the way to um, kind of inner city, and teaches them about food systems, food justice, food access, and of course, how to grow food. Um, so if you're interested in any of these organizations, please do look them up. And I'm very, very happy to talk with anyone who's interested um, about how you could get involved if you want. Great. And before we break to questions, I know you have a slide of your new cookbook, and it's so creative and fantastic. I've had a chance to look through it. Just tell us a little bit about it and the process of how it came to be realized. Yes, so Perfectly Good Food was written primarily by my sister, um, but I am a great copy editor, and so she put my name on it. Um, and actually, I'll just say, I am busy, but I also delegate a lot. Uh, and so this is a great example of that. 
Perfectly Good Food came out of the fact that as, as home cooks and chefs, we don't really use recipes. And so when publishers ask us to create cookbooks with recipes, it's really hard. But also most people cook to some extent by feel or by intuition. Certainly our grandmothers and their grandmothers did um, because there were not recipe books or you know, the internet <laughs> as we have them today. We also know that food waste is a huge problem in our country where about a third of all food that is produced is never eaten. And so we wrote Perfectly Good Food to make cooking with less waste and saving money as fun and easy as possible. So I think a lot of times when people think about zero waste cooking, they're thinking about like, oh, you know, making sauerkraut and grinding up your lemon peels by hand to make all purpose cleaner or whatever. And we love that stuff, of course. But we also, at our core, we're lazy cooks. Um, we like shortcuts. We like things that you can do with electric equipment. And so we created what I think of as a toolkit. Um, lots of different tips, tricks, and ideas. And of course, this is the perfect time of year to be thinking about food waste and how to use it all up, how to be a smart, efficient, intuitive cook. And um, it also just feels good when you use up something that you thought you might have to throw out. Uh, you figure out how to put it into a frittata or a pasta bake and you're like, man, I'm smart. And that is such a great feeling. Um, and so we want to bring that to everyone. And that's how we ended up with this book, which is also illustrated by an incredible um, author and illustrator named Iris Gottlieb. The book has such a sense of humor. It is pretty self-deprecating. <laughs> but we just know that like all of us have a bag of spinach that's too old in our fridge. Or we did last week, and we learned better. <laughs> but I think we just know that um, doing a better job has to be fun or else no one's gonna do it. And so that's what this book is really about. And I'll just remind you that we'll have Irene's books out in the foyer afterwards and she'll be signing. So we'll open um, the floor up to audience Q&A and we have two microphones in the aisles if you wanna approach and we'll just alternate. And just a reminder to keep your questions relatively brief so we can get to everybody. Thank you very much for spending your uh, Saturday night with us and sharing your inspiring story. Um, I had a question. I was thinking about the open book and applying it to a company like ours, which is a small startup. A lot of companies spend a lot on compensation and labor, and obviously it could be a little bit of a sticky subject if everyone's like, well, if we cut out these people, we'll be more profitable. So I'm curious how that works out when you uh, do open book. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think one of the misconceptions that is out there about open book is you have to show everyone everything all at once, um, which is almost the title of that great movie, but not quite. And um, the truth is, open book is whatever the person who runs the business wants it to be. Um, it is not a democratic process necessarily, although I think it is empowering. And so compensation can be part of the conversation or not. Um, at Maymay, what we shared was how many hours did we schedule? Um, because many of our staff were hourly, and so we talked not about dollars of labor, but of hours. And we said, our average labor hour costs this. If our team had wanted to like really do the math and like figure out what everyone makes, they probably could have. Um, but we tried to keep it to something that felt tangible to them. And I think in many open book companies, um, individual compensation is just off the table for discussion. And there are other ways that they create mini games or, or um, initiatives around efficiency. Um, so there are some great resources out there. One is called The Great Game of Business, um, and there's also Zingerman's, which is based in Ann Arbor, um, a, a restaurant and food uh, family of companies. Um, and so they have a, a ton of resources about how you might approach that. Thank you. The internet taught me, isn't that crazy? Yeah, totally. So I, um, my, my, 
It's funny. Um, I guess when you're a, a, a child of immigrants, people think that your mom and your grandma, you know, had you at their knee. Um, and I'm like, my mom's specialty is chicken wings marinated in all the different takeout sauces from the fridge door. So like, it wasn't her. Although she is, she is a good cook. But you know, she worked full time, and so she wasn't the one cooking every night. Um, so I became obsessed with um, Good Eats the show that Alden Brown made in the kind of early noughties, um, and then just watched hours upon hours of YouTube. So I am from like the binge watch generation of cooks, um, and I just, I still think that's the best way to learn, and anytime I, I have a question or a curiosity and I don't know the answer, I'm going to Google. Um, so like, yes, you can pay to go to culinary school, but you can also get it for free on the internet. And that's what I recommend. And I think trial and error and being willing to just give it a shot um, is an incredible way to learn. Like I usually put spinach in my smoothies and the other day I had only arugula and I put some arugula in my smoothie. And boy, will I not ever do that again. So that was a mistake that I'm really taking to heart, right? Um, and as we say in the book, like if you mess up the recipe because you freestyled a little too much, you just eat the evidence and you move on. And sometimes I think with like celebrity chef culture, we make it so serious. Like it has to come out perfect. It has to look like the picture in the magazine. And it's like, it's just food on a plate and on some level. And so that's kind of what the advice I would give if, if you're thinking about how you want to learn to cook. Thank you. Hi. And you can take this down a bit. I went out a couple of times in the past six weeks or so, and I was taken aback when I encountered a kitchen appreciation fee mm. or a kitchen administration fee. It was called different things at different places. And I thought it was a bit disingenuous on the part of the restaurant owner that they should just pay their staff and charge us what it costs to pay their staff. But I'm not either a kitchen owner or restaurant owner or a kitchen worker and or any of that. And I wondered in your line of work what, what your take on that is. What a great question. Thank you. So the question is about the kitchen appreciation fee or the administrative fee. Um, Again, this is why we need legislation to change the way we talk about compensation in restaurants. One thing that everyone should know um, is that when you tip, there are two states in the country where those tips may not be shared with a member of the back of the house under any circumstances. Those two states are Massachusetts and New York. Weird, right? Um, in theory, this is to protect the front of the house, but it also means that even if a restaurant owner chooses to pay everyone the same wage, they cannot choose to pay everyone the tips in the same manner. And so when we talk about legislation, it's a two-pronged approach. One piece of it is raising the sub-minimum wage. The second piece of it is making sure everyone can access tips on top. And so the reason the restaurant implements that fee is so that they can earmark more revenue for the back of the house. It's confusing. I agree that it's disingenuous. And I think that it makes customers resent us. But we're doing these contortions because the laws do not make sense for the way restaurants work now. We are just tying ourselves in knots and pissing off the people we rely on because we can't just do what we want to do. I think one thing that many people are afraid of is if I charge what it actually costs, no one will come here. And that is why we need a law that applies to everyone so that people aren't saying, oh, well, up the street, there's no fee, but a bagel is $17. And down the street, there is, or sorry, up the street, <laughs> yeah. And so if everyone is asked to perform to the same standard and to follow the same rules, we will not have these situations where restaurant owners have to opt in to do something that is very uncomfortable and very, um, and that looks bad in order to take better care of their team. So I think any business owner who's trying to make it work with these fees, hopefully will be in favor of this legislation, but it's gonna be a tough fight. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks. I 
love listening to you talk. It's very inspiring. Um, I'm, my question is, when you go out to eat, where do you like to go? Oh, wow. Okay. How much time do we have? Um, We're all going to write this down. Too. Okay. Um, I... God, where, 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 where do I even start? Um, my husband's here. He can help me. Um, Comfort Kitchen in Dorchester. Fabulous new restaurant. Recently on the Bon Appetit list. Rubato, a breakfast and lunch place in Quincy. Also recently on a very nice list. Cafe Sushi outside of Harvard Square in Cambridge. is takeout only right now, but it's still the best sushi for the best price that you can get anywhere in Boston, and it is a second-generation Japanese-owned business, and um, a lot of sushi restaurants are not. We also love Punjab Palace in Alston. Um, we live in Brighton, and so that is um, a great option for us. Um, if anyone has more specific cuisine-centric questions or uh, location-centric questions, I can get even more specific. Um, but uh, I think, in general, I would say, like, if it's independently owned, that is a huge plus. Um, if it is immigrant-owned, that's a huge plus. And um, yeah, knowing who runs the business and seeing if their staff seem happy, those are things that, that matter to me when I choose where to eat. Thanks. Thank you. It looks like we have one more coming up. Um, so you, um, your cookbook is about um, waste for home. Oh, yeah, whoops. Um, the cookbook here that is about home uh, cooking waste, you know, how to, you know, zero waste. I'm curious about restaurants, of what strategies restaurants have for trying to reduce waste, food waste. Love this question. Restaurants are actually pretty good about food waste because it's someone's job to not throw the food out. It's actually many people's job not to throw the food out. Um, but when you're at home, you have several other jobs, probably, um, that are not about managing the waste in your kitchen. Um, statistically, restaurants make up a significant portion of food wasted in this country, but all of our home kitchens make up a much, much bigger chunk. Um, and so if you have climate anxiety, like I do, um, or you're wondering, like, how many paper straws do I need to have melt in my mouth before I can feel okay about being a consumer? Um, I think food waste is, is an area that consumers could tackle at home on an individual basis and make a meaningful difference. Um, in restaurants, I would say typically cooks are really good at repurposing things, um, at uh, preserving or finding ways to store things, and I think um, you know, of all of the different expenses a restaurant business has, cost of goods is, is usually one of the really controllable ones, and it's one that everybody in the restaurant has some insight into. And so I think there are early interventions that restaurant chefs make if they think they might have an issue with a product later on. Great, and what's next for you, Irene, before we close up? Oh my gosh, um, I think I'm gonna go home and go to bed. Um, <laughs> So I, I am really excited to keep working on Prep Shift because I think that there's so much good that we can do to ensure a very delicious and diverse future in the restaurant industry. I also want to keep spreading the message around Open Book, and I think at Prep Shift we're still trying to figure out how to do that. Um, open Book is a kind of in a, in a lot of ways, it, it's, a, it's misconceived by people who hear about it, and so we're thinking about, do we need a rebrand? Um, I went to an open book conference once, um, and it was like a lot of dudes in suits, and I was like, I think I need a different conference to go to. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about that. But in general, I think I want to find ways to make sure that workers and business owners know that our interests really are aligned and that we are not each other's enemies and however I can do that that's that's what I'm really excited about that's great thank you so much and thank you and thank you all for coming out on a Saturday night and again Irene will be Signing, we'll be selling and signing books out in the foyer. So thank you so much, everybody. And a big round of applause for Merrill, please. Thank you.